Okay, other properties of uh, measurable functions. Uh, if you take f from x a to uh, r, it could be it. Well, well, let's take r b and g same thing. Then f plus g and f g are also measurable. Um, uh, multiplication. The book does that by using product spaces. I haven't talked about product spaces yet. We'll, we'll do that. So I'm not going to prove that. Uh, I, I may be able to avoid that. But So for the time being, let's just, it's not very difficult to believe, let's not prove that. Uh, the, the issue you see is that when you look at f plus g minus 1, you don't have any easy way to express this in terms of f minus 1 and g minus 1. And same thing for f times g. So that's why things are not so easy. Well, it's not difficult, but uh, uh, you, you need product spaces to do that. So we we'll, we we'll omit the proof for the time being. Uh, something else which is useful. So what do I need here? So if I have a G that goes from y with a Borel in y to r with and if I have f that goes from x a into y b y and that Okay, and uh, let's assume that G is continuous and F is measurable, uh, Borel measurable because we're using the Borel sigma algebra here. Then, uh, so which way do I go? Uh, G composed with F is Borel measurable. Okay, so you can compose a continuous, but it's continuous from the left side. Uh, it's quite important if you if you do it uh, if if you put your continuous function on this side and the measurable one on this one, you may have bad surprises. Okay, so it works on when you compose from the left with your continuous function. To prove that, uh, first a little lemma. If you do uh, g composed with f minus 1, uh, you actually get f minus 1 composed with g minus 1. Okay, so proof of a lemma. Uh, assume that you have x belonging to g composed with f minus 1. That by definition means that uh, g composed with f of x, uh, well, I need a set.
it means that yes, G composed with F of X must belong to B, which means that G of F of X must belong to B, which means that F of X must belong to G minus 1 of B, which means that X must belong to F minus 1 of G minus 1 of B. Okay, so it's just a little proof that uses the definition of uh, the inverse image. So we have that, and now we go back to our problem here. Well, what we do is we take uh, we take u uh, open in R, and then we have that uh, g minus one of u is open in Y. Right, because G goes from Y to R, then it means also that G minus one of U belongs to BY. Since F is measurable, we get that F minus one of G minus one of U uh, belongs to A. So we we use the usual trick. If our E is the set of U open in R, then we have that uh, G composed with F minus one of U belongs to A for every U in E. Hence Uh, this composition is measurable. Since uh, M of E is actually BY. Uh, BR in this case. Well, an application on that. If f is different from zero, it's an average zero, and measurable, then one over f is measurable as well. Okay, because 1 over f is g composed with f, where g of x is 1 over x, and that's a continuous function. So you can build quite a few other measurable functions once you have uh, properties of this type. So it's, it's Is there any restriction on RT? Well, G, 
G is going to be continuous uh, on minus infinity zero, union zero infinity. And, uh, the, and I mean, you can define one over F only if your F is different from zero. So it's okay. You don't, you, you don't get any, any problem because of that. Okay. The next uh, uh, step, what, what we'll do a lot is look at sequences of functions in this class. And um, for instance, uh, we can have, we can define fn of x, let's define fn of x to be exponential of minus nx for uh, x between 0 and 1. And, and any natural. Okay, we define like this uh, uh, sequence of functions. Um, you see that these are, of course, uh, continuous functions. Okay, because it's just uh, a composition of, compu of uh, continuous functions. And then you can, uh, you can do the following. You can let, uh, if you do fn of 0, you always find 1. And 1 converges to 1 as n goes to infinity. And then if your x is strictly bigger than 0 but uh, less than 1, let's say, then fn of x, which is exponential minus nx, as n goes to infinity, so, so your x is fixed, and you are letting n go to infinity, where does this converge to? Zero converges to zero. Okay, so if you define the function f, by f of zero equal to one, and f of x equal to zero for x in zero one, Then you can say the following, that fn of x converges to f of x as n goes to infinity for every x in 0, 1. Right? You, you just uh, you know, collect the limits. You define your function as being this collection of limits. And you have this convergence. This is called pointwise convergence. Okay? So fn converges to f pointwise. There are several ways of converging. This is uh, the easiest way. Or, you, know, but, uh, you fix your x, and then you, let, you look at what fn of x does. So what's remarkable here is that you have a nice uh, sequence of continuous functions, but this thing is not continuous. Okay, it's not continuous because it's uh, 1 at 0, and it's 0 elsewhere. So you have this jump. So you lost continuity in your limit. Now, uh, we are not going to lose measurability when we have limits. So if, you ha if we have a sequence of measurable functions, it will be measurable. But that's a little bit uh, uh, 
wherever what's coming next uh, comes from. I mean, it's this type of example that we have in mind. Now, as always, it's not necessar necessary to have a limit existence. So that's why we're going to do the following. If we have, if we have a sequence uh, of functions fn, then define lim sub of fn as lim sub of fn of x equal to uh, sub for k bigger than n of k fk of x and inf of o n and of course the same thing for lim inf of fn Okay, so that gives us something to work with when we don't know yet that the function, that the sequence of functions converges, and uh, we can we can use these notions. Okay, yeah, of course this is the natural definition. What else are you going to do to define these new functions? But they still need to be defined. Okay, so now we we know what these things mean. Okay, so now let's look at the sequence fn from x a to y m. Well, actually um, I need to be in, in the rails. Uh, sequence of Borel measurable functions. Then Then the supremum of fn of x, well, then if we define g to be the supremum of fn and h to be the infimum of fn, then these two functions then these two functions are measurable. Okay, so the proof of that if we look at the G minus one of uh, a positive infinity. It's the set of x such that G of x is strictly bigger than a. Now G of x is defined as being the supremum.
of fn of x over ln bigger than a. Well, I claim that this is equal to the union over all n of the axes for which fn of x is strictly bigger than a. So let's um, let's prove this. If if supremum of f of x is bigger than a, then it means that there exists at least one n such that f of x is bigger than a, strictly bigger than a. Why? Well, if I cannot find such an n, it means that for every n, f n of x is less than or equal to a. And then the supremum would be less than a. So it's, I have this, which means that my x belongs to the union of all these sets. Which, by the way, to avoid writing every time all of that, what we do is we write this as being simply fn bigger than a. Goes quickly. So, now, what can I say about this set? What can I say about the set fn bigger than a? Is this a measurable set? Uh, and why? Well, it's the inverse image of uh, a positive infinity, and these are measurable functions. So these are measurable sets. Okay? So this thing here must belong to the sigma algebra since fn is measurable. And then you take a union of measurable sets, you get a measurable set. So the whole thing must belong to A. Oh, I got sidetracked. Uh, we need that, but I need the, the reverse inclusion first. So, So this is a side remark, which will be important. Now, for the other way around, we need the following remark. If So for the reverse inclusion, if x belongs to the union of these guys, then it means that fn of x, uh, that there exists at least one n such that fn of x is strictly bigger than a, which implies that the supremum of fn of x must also be strictly bigger than a. OK, because the supremum is an upper bound of these guys, if one of them is bigger than A, the upper bound needs to be bigger than A as well. Okay. So it's, it's really uh, the same thing. And uh, my remark there works well. So that's, that's how I know that, uh, okay, so the set G bigger than A is this union of fn bigger than a, 
And this is in A, as we marked earlier. And therefore, G is measurable. Okay? Questions? Now we do exactly a symmetric thing with the infimum. But it's more convenient to work with smaller than for the infimum. And so what we do now for the infimum, so H is the infimum over all n of Fn. And if I look at H smaller than A, then this is the union over all n of Fn smaller than A. Why? Well, uh, if the infimum of Fn is less than A, this is true. All, if and only if there is, there is at least one n for which fn is less than a. So I should put the x's here. Why is that? Well, if my infimum is less than a, it means that at least one of them must be less than a. Otherwise, they are all larger than a, and the infimum is larger than a. So that cannot be. Now, if each one of them is less than A, then the infimum must be less than A as well, because the infimum is the greatest lower bound. And if they are all less than A, it means that uh, you, you can get a lower bound which is less than A. So if you have that, then your set H less than A is really the union of all Fn less than A. Same reasoning as before, this thing is going to belong to A. So this belongs to A, therefore H is measurable. Okay, so what's, why is this important? Well, it's important because then it lets us conclude that limb sub and limb inf of a sequence are also measurable. And that's something we'll be working with over time, so that's why we need to make sure they are measurable. So that's the next property. So the Fn are sequence again going from XA to RB then lim inf of Fn and lim sub of Fn are measurable. Well, uh, I need the Fn to be measurable of course. And the proof is easy now that we have this, because for lim inf, for instance, we get a sub of inf of fk. Now we can call 
GK, we can call it mth of FK. Uh, that's GN. Right, we define a new function, GN, by doing that, and our GN is going to be measurable. GN is measurable because it's the infimum of measurable functions, and that's the thing we just saw. If you do the infimum, you still get measurable functions. And then the supremum of the GN is also measurable. Because GNs are measurable, so the supremum of measurable functions is measurable. And so you end up with a lim inf of Fn measurable. And lim sub, of course, is the symmetric thing. You, you invert your, your inf and sub, and you get it. So I'm not going to do it. So that, that turns out to be uh, quite important to, to know that the limb sub and limb inf of uh, these functions are measurable because we, we'll be taking limb sub and limb inf all the time. Okay. Now, a consequence of this, or an application of it, is the following. Assume that fn of x converges to f of x for all x, and assume that the fn are measurable. then f is measurable. So how do we prove that? How do we prove that f is measurable using what we just did? Uh, what happens is that f of x is really the limb sub of fn. Right? Because it's the limit. Therefore, it's the limb sub, it's the limit. But this guy here is measurable. So we are done. Okay, so for, for next time homework, you, you need a following.
So assume that f and g are measurable. Then the set of x's such that f of x is equal to g of x is measurable. How would you prove that? How, how do you prove that if f and g are measurable, the set where f of x is equal to g of x is a measurable set? Can you express this set as the inverse image of something? Okay, you could write this as f of x minus g of x equal to 0. So this is really f minus g minus 1 of 0, isn't it? And this is a Borel set. Why is it a Borel set? Well, because it's closed, for instance, or it's the intersection of two open sets. There are 100 reasons, but you need to be able to justify this type of thing. This is closed. This is Borel. This is a Borel set, and the inverse image of a Borel set by a Borel function is Borel. Okay, so this is measurable. So here I should have said Borel measurable. So for, which one is it? For uh, the problem 3 on page 48, you need to use this fact. To prove that uh, the point where the limit of a sequence exists is a uh, is a measurable set. Okay. Then for four, uh, four you ask to prove that if f minus one of r positive infinity belongs to uh, M, or to the Borel set, for every R rational, then F is measurable. Now, what, what fact about the rationals is going to to be important in this problem. Because what you what you what you would really what you need to prove is that F minus one of A positive infinity belongs to A. For any real A. Okay, so we are, again, we are, we are restricting our set E even more than before by taking rationals. But I know that rationals can approximate e, A as close as I want, and that's what I'm going to use. 
Okay, I know that uh, because of uh, the density of the rationals, I can find Rn between A and A plus 1 over N, for instance. There is a sequence of rationals between A and A plus 1 over N. That's going to converge to A. So, and that's what I'm going to use by using unions of sets of this type or intersections. That's going to give me that this is in A. And I'll be done. Okay, just the density of the rationals. Then I'd like you to do number eight. Where you ask that, so you have a function f going from r into r, which is monotone. And show that this implies that f is uh, Borel measurable. Okay, so how do you do that? Uh, okay, so what you when, one way to do it is to to show the following. That if I is an interval. of R, then F minus 1 of I is also an interval. Because intervals are nice. Intervals are going to generate your Borel sigma algebra. So if you can show this, now to show that this is an interval, uh, what maybe we should? No, not strictly. It's either decreasing or increasing, and uh, it could be strict or not. So uh, the definition of an interval i is an interval if for every x and y in i and z belonging z between x and y, we have z belonging to i. Okay, an interval has no holes. So if you have x and y, anything in between must be also in your interval. So that's what you need to prove with f minus 1 of i. You need to show if I have an x in f minus 1 of i, a y in f minus 1 of i, then any z in between must be also in f minus 1 of i. It's very easy. Just by writing it, you get it. Then from this definition, you get the usual thing that uh, uh, the 
you get the usual property that intervals, all intervals of R are minus infinity A, A, B, uh, then you have all the possibilities for the boundary, A positive infinity. And, and every time you have the possibility that it's closed or open or semi-open, you, know, you have two over possibilities, but this is all you have for your intervals. And the, the way you prove that uh, this is the only possibility is that you, you start with this definition and you discuss the existence of an infimum and a supremum of your set. For instance, if your set is not bounded below, well, it means that it has to go all the way to minus infinity because you don't want any hole. So if it's not bounded below, it means that it goes, it goes as, uh, to minus infinity as much as we want. But since everything must be covered, you need to have something completely like that. So that's, and, and the other one, of course, is minus infinity, positive infinity. All these are are intervals of R. So at this point we have examples of uh, uh, measurable functions. We have the continuous functions, we have the monotone functions, but what's something a little bit uh, weirder, like uh, something like this. Where you have uh, constant, then it jumps here, and then it continues like this. This is not continuous, this is not monotone, this is still measurable, of course. Okay, so that's uh, an additional homework, show that this function is measurable. It's measurable because when you do inverse images of intervals, you get something nice. You, you never get something pathological. And there is this uh, uh, very nice theorem that we'll see that shows that measurable functions are almost continuous in the following sense, that if, if f is measurable, this is called Egorov's theorem. So assume that f is measurable. Then for every epsilon, you can find an A such that mu of a is less than epsilon, and f is continuous on the complement of a. So if you allow me to throw away some, something, a set that has measure less than epsilon, then my function is continuous everywhere else. Okay, so that's rather strong. It shows, you know, that uh, you are not so far from continuity. And that's a big difference between continuity and differentiability. Of course, differentiability is something that never happens, in fact. Okay, most functions are nowhere differentiable. And most functions are almost continuous in this sense. Questions? Okay, so let's stop here.